Okay. Um, our very special guest speaker is a veteran grassroots organizer whose roots are in the black liberation and anti-apartheid movements as well as Central American solidarity struggles. He is an internationally recognized leader of the emerging human rights movement in the U.S. and has been at the forefront of efforts to apply the international human rights framework to social justice advocacy in the U.S. for the more than 25 years. As such, he has provided human rights trainings for grassroots activists across the country, briefings on human rights to the U.S. Congress, and appeared before and provided statements to various United Nations agencies, including the U.N. Human Rights Commission. Boys and Men is very proud to give you Dr. Ajama Baraka. Thank you so much, Professor. And thank all of you for coming out this afternoon. <clears throat> I kind of geared my, um, my presentation primarily to students, uh, but that's fine. We, we will make some slight uh, alterations. Let me just first begin by giving, um, sharing with you a little bit more about the work that uh, we are involved in. Uh, right now, I am the national organizer for a new formation uh, we've been in place for two and a half years, is the Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, it is a uh, formation of individuals and organizations uh, that are committed to trying to revive the traditional uh, anti-war, uh, anti-imperialist uh, positions of the Black Liberation Movement uh, and black people uh, in general. Uh, we see this as an effort to not only uh, revitalize the black uh, community, uh, but also we see this as part of our efforts to try to uh, revive, if you will, the broader anti-war movement here in this country. And we see that as critical uh, because of the uh, very dangerous times that we're in. Uh, we believe that it was important to try to revive an anti-war movement in this country after we saw uh, the kinds of moves that were made uh, internationally over the last 18 years, uh, and the lack of response or opposition, if you will, uh, from the general public, specifically during the Obama years. Uh, many people argue, and I think it's a, a, a correct uh, perspective, uh, that during the years of the Obama administration, um, all opposition to U.S. Um, aggressiveness, uh, U.S. intervention, uh, U.S. imperialism basically disappeared. There was a shift in um, perceptions in terms of the legitimacy of U.S. interventions. Uh, it gave uh, U.S. interventions a new uh, look as opposed to the opposition we saw generated to the policies of George Bush, um, Barack Obama, that continued to some, some of the same policies, um, uh, they were now seen as legitimate, justifiable, rational responses to a uh, changing and dangerous international environment. So as a consequence, uh, the U.S. state had a free hand uh, to advance its um, his program, uh, like the uh, Bush administration, uh, the Obama administration, uh, and now the Trump administration, have all been united in their broad uh, commitment uh, to what uh, many refer to as full spectrum dominance. Uh, that is uh, the idea that uh, the U.S. as the uh, global he hegemon uh, the exceptional power uh, that um, any uh, regional challenge to that power uh, should be seen as um, an enemy, uh, and those regional powers will be targeted uh, and eventually uh, eliminated. We've seen that as policy over the last two decades, uh, beginning with the invasion of uh, Iraq, uh, and all of the other activities, all of the other interventions that we all know about here in this room, Iraq, um, uh, Syria, uh, the attack on Libya, 
the expansion of the drone warfare. Um, every regional uh, power, Libya and Africa, Iraq uh, in the so-called Middle East, uh, Syria as part of the axis of resistance, um, the Russians, uh, the Chinese, um, all of these various states have found themselves in the crosshairs of U.S. aggression. So that's why we uh, worked to uh, begin the process of rebuilding some opposition to this activity because we thought it was a contradiction, a moral contradiction as a matter of fact, uh, that the U.S. state could be involved in all of these activities across the planet resulting in real suffering, real death and destruction. Um, but yet people in this country are completely unaware and largely in support. So um, we felt like now was the time to in fact uh, raise these issues. But that's not the thrust of my conversation this afternoon. Uh, Gus asked me to frame the discussion. Uh, he had a few questions that uh, uh, we wanted to address related to uh, how we got here today, not just in terms of the anti-war movement, uh, but in terms of the political environment uh, in the U.S., uh, the electoral struggle that uh, uh, is unfolding now uh, in the Democratic Party uh, as we prepare for the elections uh, in in 2020. And that's what we want to talk about in this conversation. And we hope that we can generate some conversation. Um, you know, I wanted to share with the students that um, there really is a need for a critical nonpartisan analysis. Um, in this period, uh, one thing that's quite troubling is the kind of, of lack of tolerance for different kinds of voices and different perspectives. You know, we all were uh, concerned with and focused on the Trump administration and what many people saw as the threat uh, from that administration, from Trump as a person and his administration, uh, and what they define as the rise of the extreme right, the radical right, the extreme right. Uh, and many people said this was the beginning of a more uh, open, uh, neo-fascist um, configuration here in this country. And of course, it appears to be uh, elements of that uh, related uh, and part of the Trump administration. But what was also troubling about that perspective is that many people miss the other components of what was unfolding here in this country. And that is, as we were focused on Donald Trump and the threats that he um, presented, there was a more, perhaps even more insidious threat that was unfolding that had even longer term <coughs> implications than Donald Trump. And what was that? This alliance that was already in place, uh, but uh, was now being used uh, as a consequence of so-called Russian gate to begin to constrict the range of information uh, and the range of, 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 of ideals and perspective that they were supposed to be acceptable. This, this Russian gate uh, phenomenon resulted in these the, the big tech companies uh, connected to Silicon Valley that always had a connection to the um, Democratic Party establishment, they used Russiangate to engage in a systematic process of political censorship. We focus on Trump when they began to focus on the rest of us. They began to make the argument, in fact, moved against various individuals uh, who were on the radical right. But we knew and know that the real target are those of us who are on the more uh, radical, uh, liberal radical, and revolutionary, if you will, uh, spectrum. And in fact, we saw that happening. There was this mysterious 
an article that came out in the Washington Post a couple of years ago uh, where they identified uh, uh, these news outlets that they theoretically were supposed to be part of some uh, grand Russian conspiracy to influence uh, politics in the U.S. It had this list of, 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 of outlets on that. And it was interesting for, for many of us because um, almost every one of those outlets that was listed were outlets that, uh, that, that I wrote for. <laughs> uh, so it, it, the, the implication, of course, was that we all are controlled by the Russians and our uh, uh, objective is to try to control U.S. politics uh, for, uh, for their interests, which is really a ridiculous position because the whole notion that the Russians are oppositional to the U.S. is always was always a uh, a fiction. Okay, we're talking about two systems that are basically the same. You have a an oligarchy, uh, a capitalist oligarchy in the U.S., uh, and you have a capitalist oligarchy in Russia. So all we really have was capitalist competition between those two nations. But they use Russian Gate uh, for political purposes. Uh, to uh, ratchet up the, uh, the fear, uh, to uh, mobilize people uh, to be opposed to the Russians, but also to, uh, to be opposed to any nation that they identified as either the enemy of the U.S. or the potential enemy of the U.S. So it was the Russians, uh, it was the Chinese, uh, but the main objective, in our opinion, was to put in place a, a, a foundation, uh, a justification uh, for them to be able to control uh, information and to control information that they would define as, as subversive. And that is information that is trying to get to the American people to begin to, for them to begin to understand where their real objective interests lie. That their interest uh, wasn't necessarily uh, with having to oppose the Russians or the Chinese, but that perhaps uh, their better interest was to understand that the interest of this oligarchy in the U.S. was in fact not their interest, the interest of the masses of the people. That perhaps uh, the, the capitalist crisis we have in the U.S. now is not really solvable without real systemic change that perhaps uh, we don't need to be mobilized to be prepared to go to war with uh, Russia or the Chinese or the Syrians uh, when uh, black and brown people are being murdered in the streets of this country. That perhaps we should be concerned with the fact that we have a uh, Department of Defense program, 1033, that's responsible for transferring $4 billion worth of military grade equipment from the military to the police forces across this country. That maybe it's not in our interest to have uh, over 800 uh, U.S. bases scattered around the world, um, taking $156 billion in order to maintain. That perhaps uh, the $6 trillion that, that was spent since uh, 2003 on wars could have been better utilized to address the human rights and human needs that we have here in this country for health care, for education, for some uh, rec centers for, uh, for our youth and summer jobs. You know, uh, This money that was spent wasn't money that just went into the air. It, was, it went somewhere. It went into the pockets of the military industrial complex. So, you know, our job is to help people to understand where their true interests lie. But in attempting to do that, you become a threat. You become a subversive. Uh, your ideals are subversive. Therefore, they need to be controlled. And that's what we saw, in our opinion, uh, with this Russian gate uh, fraud. Uh, and we saw that, you see now, uh, that uh, Google, uh, they changed their uh, algorithms. Uh, so that, for example, uh, for the uh, one outlet that I, that I write for, uh, Black Agenda Report, um, saw a 60% drop 
and the number of people going to that site. And that happened to, um, to uh, Counter Punch Magazine, uh, Alternet. It happened to every progressive or radical outlet out there as a consequence of the manipulation uh, by, by Google. Uh, Twitter. Uh, we put out some, some things on Twitter basically calling for the U.S. to not to engage in interventions, uh, and we got blocked on like three different occasions. Uh, and we rolled back and said, when did peace become something subversive, something that violated your community standards? But in fact, uh, they did. Um, this is what's happening now. We are focused on Trump, but what has emerged is what I call a, 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 a new phenomenon of liberal totalitarianism because the forces driving this process are the forces primarily connected with the Democratic Party and Silicon Valley, okay? Now we might remember that, and we'll talk about this in, in more detail in a second, that there was a, a realignment of political forces here in this country uh, in 2016, uh, once Trump became the nominee for the Republicans. Uh, those forces that normally uh, voted with or supported the uh, re Republicans uh, they were so concerned with um, Donald Trump that they abandoned the Republicans and they formed a new alignment uh, with the um, uh, ruling elements in the Democratic Party. Uh, and all of the political establishment, Republicans and Democrats, uh, were opposed to Donald Trump. Uh, and when he took, when he won the election, of course, they were prepared then to move against him uh, and get rid of him in, in any way that they uh, thought that they could. So this uh, alignment, this realignment of politics is still in place. The objective was, was and still is Donald Trump. And they are now moving to try to uh, influence the Democratic Party, um, internal uh, conversations uh, and debates, uh, and to uh, now uh, perhaps even move more aggressively again against uh, Donald Trump. Well, all of this is part of the backdrop of the longer term program they have to try to maintain their hegemony uh, here uh, in this country. So we said we have to have a critical, uh, nonpartisan analysis of all these, these issues. Um, you know, I like this quote from George Orwell. He said, he said, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Let me say it one more time. Who controls the past controls the future. And who controls the present controls the past. So basically, those ruling elements that are in power today are the ones that have the ability to frame how we see history. You know, history uh, and, and memory, these are terrains of struggle, okay? They determine for us how we see the world and how we imagine the world to be in the future. But if you have powerful forces that are able to suppress the radical imagination, if they're able to, to, uh, to advance a, a narrative in which uh, people cannot even imagine an alternative to this, that basically they have won. Because at best all we would be prepared to advocate for are reforms. So this struggle uh, is one in which uh, developing radical consciousness is absolutely uh, central to our, our, uh, our objectives. Professor Gus wanted me to talk about how we got here um, and the whole phenomenon of, of Trump. Well, you know, we talk about this, this ideological struggle, uh, this struggle for defining the present and the past and imagining the future. Um, because we're talking about a process, just like the uh, evolution of Donald Trump. Donald Trump did not fall out of, out of the air. He didn't come from nowhere. Donald Trump and the forces uh, behind Donald Trump are part of a historical process, okay? The notion that he represents some type of, of aberration, some 
uh, some departure from the U.S. experience is, is, uh, is fiction. Uh, and, and, the, and the idea that Donald Trump is the worst president is really ridiculous, okay? I mean, you, you eliminate the first, what, nine uh, U.S. presidents that were slave owners. I think they were, they were pretty bad also. <clears throat> Donald Trump is a process of uh, change uh, that's been 40 years in the making. What do I mean by that? In the 1970s, as part of the uh, neo, part of the counter-revolutionary uh, threats from the state. Now we, we don't have to go talk about the 1960s in this crowd. We, we all remember and we know about the struggles in the 1960s. But in, by the 1970s, uh, some of us argue that um, there was a very aggressive response from the state. We know that the state uh, responded aggressively, uh, targeting elements of the Black Liberation Movement uh, and the uh, radical uh, white revolutionary movement also, uh, resulting in, and we all remember and we know about, uh, COINTELPRO. This was their counterintelligence program uh, that was geared toward disrupting and undermining uh, the radical struggles of the 1960s and into the 1970s. By the mid-1970s, though, there was a shift. <clears throat> uh, once they had basically suppressed uh, the movement, uh, driven a number of people into exile, um, incarcerated a number of, of, of activists, uh, the, the counter-revolutionary process shifted more toward an ideological response. And for the black community, the response was to try to put in place conditions in which a radical uh, revolutionary movement would never emerge again. The objective was to break down any sense of peoplehood among black people in this country uh, and to, in effect, uh, make us Americans. That's on the ideological side. On the economic side, what we had was the beginnings of, of the rise of neoliberalism. Um, that um, basically the kinds of great society uh, programs of the 1960s and the expansion of the, of the welfare state, um, the relatively generous uh, uh, services uh, that were being offered to the people, including generous Pell Grants and all of that, all of those were being systematically taken away. Uh, and what was being put in place was uh, state austerity, uh, moving from uh, the ability to get Pell Grants and come to a, a Montgomery College and pay all your tuition and have money left over uh, to have a, uh, an apartment and maybe even buy a car. Now you have to go straight into uh, significant debt in order to get through these, these institutions. Uh, that was that was intentional. You know, if you have young people who are concerned about having to secure um, a loans uh, and knowing that they have to then pay those loans back uh, once they uh, leave college, uh, it has a a dampening of effect on one's radicalness. You get very very pragmatic very quickly. Okay, and that was the intent. So they start moving toward neoliberalism, which basically is, is, is moving the state out of the way and, and turning everything over uh, to the private sector, uh, uh, undermining uh, confidence in the ability of the state to address any of the needs that we have uh, as a uh, collective uh, humanity. Uh, they started to offshore uh, jobs. They took, uh, in essence, they took the manufacturing base uh, from uh, the U.S. Uh, to first to Mexico uh, and then to, uh, to China and other parts of, of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, they uh, assaulted uh, labor, made it very difficult for labor to organize itself. Uh, they increased uh, not only student debt but also consumer debt. They uh, uh, broke down any resistance that other states had to the penetration of U.S. capital. They made them to uh, 
uh, uh, to allow the penetration of U.S. capital into their nations. Uh, they made nations that were uh, food dependent uh, and transferred, transformed them into uh, food. Um, uh, they, they, they were first food, depend, food uh, dependent and they made them food independent all the way around, correct? Countries that had the ability to produce for themselves in terms of food were now undermined and they were thrust into the world market uh, and became dependent in terms of uh, food from other parts of the world. This is all part of the neoliberal thrust. The result was that basically by the time that Trump emerged, uh, the people were, were tired. They uh, have seen their um, economy transformed. They've seen people who have gone from good paying jobs to now uh, service jobs, uh, uh, flipping burgers uh, and information processing. Uh, they uh, saw that, that uh, um, in 2016, um, the average working class wage was the same as it was uh, adjusted for inflation uh, in 1973. So there was 40 years of wage uh, stagnation. Uh, 140 million people are either poor or have low income with 80% living from paycheck to paycheck. Even after Obamacare, 34 to 38 million people still lack health care. 40 million people live below the official poverty line. And we say official because when you start um, factoring in other uh, elements, uh, you find that that number uh, is even bigger than that. Uh, we've been told that there's a reduction in unemployment. Uh, but when you look at, uh, when you segment it and look at the different sectors of the population, you find that to be a myth also. And in particular, when you look at black youth unemployment. You have black youth unemployment in some parts of this country that's like 40, 50, 60 percent of young people are unemployed. In places like Chicago, people talk about all the violence in Chicago, but in parts of Chicago, we have 70 percent youth unemployment. That is, uh, people between 16 and 24. 70 percent are unable to secure a job. So this is the reality that people faced in 2016. Um, and for black people, it was even more significant because one of the uh, very important elements that people need to be to, to understand is that one of the reasons why we were here was for our labor. Uh, we were transported here to, to make others money. Okay? And even after official slavery, uh, that was still our role. We still played a very important role in the economy, providing low-wage uh, uh, labor. But my friends, that is all different today. Today, black labor has become economically redundant. It's no longer needed. We are, in many ways, seen as a surplus population. So that we have this strange phenomenon <clears throat> that you take a young person who's 17 and they secure a job making uh, the minimum wage. And the minimum wage is, is what? Anybody know? How much? 1350. Anybody else? Federal. Federal minimum wage. Yeah. There you go. Set. People would love it to be 13. <laughs> No, 775. That comes out to about fifteen thousand five hundred dollars per year. Okay. Now, what that means is that, and not just young people who making that kind of money. Uh, you know, what that means is theoretically you can only purchase in terms of goods and services fifteen thousand five hundred dollars worth of stuff, right? That's before after taxes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good good question. <clears throat> Let's say uh, after taxes, you still have 15,000, okay? Now, you take that same black body that is able to participate in the uh, real economy uh, and purchase uh, 
uh, $15,000 worth of goods and services. Take that same black body and incarcerate it. That same black body incarcerated generates for whatever state, 30, 40, 50, California, $60,000 in goods and services. And then you wonder why we have two million people in prison, the largest number on this planet. We'll come to you. Uh, my last question. Uh, 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 go ahead. Sorry, I was really curious. So how is that money generated? Is that, is that from taxpayer dollars, I'm guessing? Is that how it? Yes. So the taxpayer dollars goes to fund the, a private jail? They're just private. Right? Public also. Yeah. Because right. most of them are public. The private, the private sector is still relatively uh, uh, minor. Okay. That's what I was wondering. <clears throat> yes. So they're taking our money, our taxpayer money, and that money is being transferred from us to the pockets of those people uh, who work in the prisons, who provide the, uh, the food, uh, the uniforms, um, you know, when they buy the land. You know, so these black bodies have value except that the value is uh, more what is incarcerated, all right? And that is now the new reality because those black bodies are no longer needed in the private economy, the quote unquote real economy, you know? That's why you have this, this aggressive expansion of prisons uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. It became big business. Most of those prisons were located where? in rural communities. Most of the guards that were being hired were, were white, white working class folks, okay? It became a job program for the rural white communities using black bodies. But that is the reality we have today, that basically we are facing a new reality. And when you have that kind of reality, uh, when you have us more valuable incarcerated than walking around free, that's very dangerous. Not only do you understand why we are incarcerated, it begins to become clear why we are hyper-policed. Because we, we are, we out, our young people out there in the streets, you know, uh, they don't have jobs, uh, they're doing what they need to do to try to survive. But they get caught up in this treadmill, you know, uh, from hustle it a little bit, you might at some point make some money, and live the good life uh, for an average of about 23 months, you get popped, you go to prison uh, for 30 years. Okay, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't pan out for you. But that's the treadmill that we caught up in because we now are a surplus population. Now I say all that not to suggest, not to you know, sound pessimistic, but again, the need for objective sober analysis that basically what that suggests to us is that unless there's real, there's real fundamental change, that we basically are doomed as a population, okay? So this was the reality that Trump faced, not only in terms of what's happening to black people and black working class folks, but to the broader society, uh, white workers. Um, you know, uh, when uh, Trump was, was raising questions about uh, the plight of workers, and suggesting that the um, uh, Democrats uh, were in the pockets of the transnational elites uh, and pointed to things like uh, NAFTA uh, and TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that they were pushing, which is gonna be a uh, expansion of US uh, capital control uh, throughout the entire uh, uh, Southeast region, uh, Southeast Asia region, um, Trump used that as an example to show that these people were out of touch with the realities of the American people. He said that these people are still trying to take your jobs to other parts of the world. He said that if I become president, I'm going to uh, squash TPP. I'm going to renegotiate uh, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, that took uh, jobs to, uh, to Mexico. And there was a concrete response from workers not just white workers, okay? But they want us to believe that these are just the so-called deplorables uh, that were supporting uh, Donald Trump. You know, right before the election, uh, many people don't remember that there was a hike, uh, a premium hike 
uh, for so-called Obamacare. And people were shocked at the fact that their uh, medical uh, premiums went up 22% in many cases. That had an impact on people's perception uh, of the election, okay? So these were the realities that people faced. So when they went to, uh, to vote in November 2016, what did we have? We had 14% uh, of black people who voted, who came out to vote in 2012, stayed home. We had nine million white workers uh, that voted for Obama 2012, switching their votes uh, to Donald Trump. We had Donald Trump, despite all of the uh, stuff that came out about his issues with women, uh, winning 53% uh, of white women's vote. We had something like 26% of the so-called Hispanic vote going to Donald Trump. Uh, this was the reality the people uh, felt and they uh, translated those feelings of economic anxiety and fear into voting for uh, Donald Trump. Why? Because uh, the Clinton uh, folks and the Democrats, they were offering, in essence, more of the same. You remember that, that uh, Hillary Clinton wrapped herself in Obama and said that, uh, you know, while Donald Trump talked about make uh, America great again, uh, the Democrats said that um, America was already great. Now, I was on the, on the campaign trail. As I think uh, you all know, I ran on the Green uh, Party ticket uh, with Jill Stein. And we were moving across this country, and people were coming to us and saying, where is this America's already great? We are suffering. That, that line wasn't resonating with people who were living in real life, okay? But that's what the Clinton administration was doing. They were offering more of the same neoliberalism. Now, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting also, too, how Trump became the nominee, because we see something very similar happening today. How did Trump become the nominee for the Democratic Party? I mean, clearly the most inexperienced of all of those candidates, uh, someone who's clearly a, uh, you know, uh, a clown, uh, who didn't know anything about uh, the world, uh, uh, supposedly. Um, how did he become the nominee? Well, you know, they talk about collusion in Russiangate uh, between the Trump administration and the Russians, but the real collusion uh, during the election process, in my opinion, was the collusion between the Clinton campaign uh, and the uh, liberal ruling elements uh, primarily those elements that control uh, corporate media. They gave Donald Trump something like $4 billion worth of free airtime. They helped make him the nominee. For them, it was a win-win situation because uh, Donald Trump was good, uh, was good for advertising. He was entertaining. People were, 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 were you know, if he's on a show, people were tuning in. Uh, they were making money, plus they were making him the nominee. The nominee that everybody knew would be defeated by Hillary Clinton. Okay. But these elites don't understand what's really going on beneath the surface, and they got caught. They got caught. And in the last two weeks of the, uh, of the election, for example, uh, I found myself in Detroit. Uh, I mean, it's like less than two weeks before the election. And I was in, I was running for vice president. I was in Detroit. And just so happened, the same day that um, um, uh, the, the Clinton vice president uh, came, what's the first name? I can't remember. Tim Kaine. Tim Kaine was in Detroit. Same day, same city. We both had activities organized in Detroit that day. Guess who was pulling bigger crowds? Ajamu Baraka, the Green Party, the Third Party. No real money. 
Tim Kaine's multi-million dollar campaign. And they had a, a picture of one of his rallies. He had 30 people in, in the audience. We knew something was going on. Something was going on. And two weeks later, we found out. We, we talked to people. They told us that uh, Ajamo, uh, the uh, Clinton campaign, they're messing up. They're not dropping uh, GOTV money where well, they should. They are believing their uh, algorithms that told them that basically they had Michigan like they thought they had the entire election. So of course, they lost Michigan, they lost Wisconsin, they lost Pennsylvania, uh, and to the shock of everybody, Donald Trump emerged as the winner in 2016. So the question becomes, and we're just touching this very quickly, um, what impact did the third party, Green Party, have on that election? Uh, we say none whatsoever. Uh, when you look at those states, uh, we were talking about this earlier, people blame the Green Party for the election of, of Donald Trump. That's ridiculous. Uh, that basically in those states where we had a decent showing, um, uh, this, the assumption that everybody who voted for us would have voted for uh, Hillary Clinton just is that it, it doesn't stand. Uh, the issue with the Clinton campaign was they just messed up. They blew it. They had a campaign uh, and had an opponent that they should have crushed, but they didn't, okay? Uh, but of course, there's a lot of anger directed toward the Green Party uh, because the Democrats were trying to figure out what happened. They were shell-shocked. Uh, so they wanted to say it was the Green Party, and then they said, well, it has to be the Russians, and you know, the Russians supposedly uh, took out some ads on Facebook, a grand total of $100,000, supposedly, we're talking about a campaign that spent multi-millions, okay? They didn't know what to say because they was basically in shock. So there was no impact uh, from the Green uh, Party. And this idea that um, independents that vote for the Green Party uh, owe their votes to the, to the Democrats, it's just uh, it's, it's backward and anti-democratic. So where are we are today, folks? Well, we are facing a very serious situation uh, here in this country, uh, the conditions have gotten even worse than in 2016. Um, uh, the so-called economic uh, recovery has turned out to be, in essence, a fraud. Uh, we see that uh, the social pathology with these uh, uh, shootings across this country, uh, people are still uh, uh, fearful about their future. Uh, we see reports coming out that says that if we don't uh, change policies, uh, that in 12 years we have reached a tipping point uh, and we're not going to be able to recover uh, from uh, global warming uh, and we see nothing really in, in response that's effective. Uh, we see uh, the uh, prison population still expanding. Uh, young black and brown uh, uh, kids are still being transferred from the uh, juvenile, prison, juvenile uh, justice system to the adult uh, system. Uh, and we see an escalation of conflict. We see the possibility now of war with Iran. We see the continuation of the Obama war uh, in Yemen. Uh, we see the U.S. still uh, trying to uh, uh, extricate itself from Afghanistan. We still see conflict in uh, Iraq. Um, uh, Libya has never recovered from the assault uh, by the U.S. and NATO. Uh, destroying uh, the most prosperous nation on the African continent. Uh, we see people who are uh, angry and afraid and confused, and that's why you see many gravitating toward the radical right, both in the U.S. Uh, and in Europe. So these are some very dangerous times. And the question becomes, how do we respond? And what should be the role of young people? Uh, and my, my uh, my message to young people was that they need to become revolutionaries, uh, that they need to make sure that they uh, develop a critical perspective on how the world uh, is operating, uh, that they uh, need to link the global uh, with the uh, international, with the, with the local, that uh, they need to link themselves up with uh, organizers in their community, 
that they need to be committed to building independent political uh, structures. Uh, and they need to be prepared for real struggle because right now we have a one-sided war being waged against uh, black, brown, and working class people here in this country. Uh, one-sided because there's no real effective opposition uh, to the program and the agenda of the ruling elements here uh, in this country. So my friends, this is where we are today. Um, I hope we can talk some more uh, and get even deeper into some of these conditions. Um, conditions that we haven't chosen for ourselves. I mean, when you are born as a human being, uh, you can't choose the conditions that you are born into. But you can choose how you respond to those conditions. And for many of us, uh, we have decided that we're going to struggle, that we believe that there is, in fact, an alternative, that we can transcend uh, this current uh, madness. So my friends, these are my very short comments. Um, I'm hoping that we can have a conversation, uh, talk about uh, the Green New Deal, talk about all kinds of things you might want to talk about uh, that are helping to shape the, the realities that we're facing uh, today. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions that you want to ask? Um, I can pull the, uh, I can give you the mic if you have questions. Or comments. Or comments, wide range. That was just signaling that I didn't have to go back to my office at one. That was just signal. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Michael Vaughn, English professor here at this campus. Um, so I, I really appreciate it and generally agree with a lot of what you're saying about the kind of parallels between uh, Russian capitalist oligarchy and our capitalist oligarchy. But here's my question, uh, follow-up. Um, do you, would you, would you be willing to speak also, do you think there are some differences that our de democratic system offers that um, the Russian system doesn't? Or do you, do you think that there truly is just kind of a flattened system uh, between the two? Because I mean, as a candidate running in the Green Party, I, I imagine you might see some potential in the democratic process. But I was just curious what you thought. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm very committed to democracy. And that's why I'm struggling to try to uh, uh, build one here in this country. Because right now, what we have is that is that democratic, is that a democracy. Uh, you have uh, two wings of one party, um, one party that is basically at the service of, of the ruling class, um, uh, that's controlled by money, of course. So we have no real democracy. And what we just talked about and shared was, even in terms of the, the, the ideals, the free speech, and the free flow of information, even that's under threat today also. So the democratic spaces that we have are constricting. And that's why, even though we say we have a democratic challenge, uh, we're still forced to defend the, 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 the so-called democracy we have today, because we see it under fire. So even though we've been reduced to just uh, every two or four years uh, going to the ballot box uh, and determining what set of oppressors we're, we're going to elect, um, even that is now being uh, even further constrained. We need to open this process up. Why is it so difficult for us to have a third party to be able to, to participate? You know, we all saw the, uh, the, the response uh, from the American people once they were exposed to the so-called Green New Deal. Well, we all know where the Green New Deal came from, or that idea, right, in this, in this room. That was the centerpiece of our, of our platform. The Green Party, Green New Deal, that was the centerpiece of our platform, and in fact, they basically took the whole platform and almost plagiarized, I mean, it was like line by line plagiarism. <clears throat> Y'all know about this as, as professors. They changed just a little bit, a few things, and they hollowed out our Green New Deal. They eliminated all references to uh, the fossil fuel industry, and of course to militarism. But even what was left, 
the people responded to. So if we would have had a chance in 2016 to present our case to the American people, I'm not saying we would have won, but we would have been able to generate a whole different conversation. You know? So why can't we have a, a broader process for that kind of democratic exchange? We can't because these forces that control this system and this society, they don't want democracy. So we have to fight for democracy. Now, how does that relate to, uh, to the Russian experience? Well, the Russians have a, a process very similar to ours in terms of its limitations. You know, there are there's significant oppositional forces in, in Russia um, that partially participate. Sometimes they are suppressed, you know. Uh, but the contradictions of Russia, you know, uh, and the contradictions of the U.S., it definitely does not put the U.S. Uh, in any kind of superior moral or political posture to be criticizing their process. You know, no matter what one might think about uh, Putin, Putin, you know, his low ratings right now is around 82% support among the Russian people. All the Russian people just screwed up. They just don't understand democracy. They, all of them are authoritarians. That's kindergarten kind of analysis, you know? Uh, so, you know, we, we, we take the position for Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, and we, we say we have to respect national sovereignty and the will of various peoples. If there are contradictions in Russia, uh, then that is for the Russian people to, in fact, deal with. Uh, the same thing here in the U.S. Uh, when Donald Trump emerged as the winner of the contest, uh, but yet uh, Hillary Clinton still got three million votes more than Donald Trump, um, if, the, if, the, if the Chinese had offered uh, an invasion force uh, of the U.S. in order to right that wrong, how many, how many people would have agreed to do that? You know? And if they did, what kind of credibility would they have had? you know, embracing a foreign force to come in and, and, and do the work for them. But that's what the U.S. does all over the planet. So yeah, there are contradictions in both systems, but our position is, and our, our, our message is, the Russian working class, the Russian people, they're not, our, they're not our enemy. When we leave this campus this afternoon, uh, and, and, and we look up in a, in a rearview mirror, and there's some blue lights, we can almost bet they won't be Russians. Okay? You know, it ain't no Russians or no Chinese who are in these prisons overseeing our people. All right? So we've got to be clear where our objective interests really lie. And we say, be very careful. Don't embrace, and it's like what uh, Mandela said when he came to the, uh, to the US the first time, and uh, Ted Koppel um, uh, posed a, a serious question, he thought, as to why uh, the ANC uh, were in alignment with uh, Gaddafi in Libya and Castro in Cuba uh, and, you know, all the, the bad guys, right? And you all remember Mandela's response? He said, you all make the mistake of assuming that your enemies are ours. <laughs> now, here we have a uh, U.S. that supported apartheid for decades. They put Mandela on the list of terrorists. And now they have the hypocritical uh, uh, stance of criticizing the ANC, a liberation movement, for accepting support uh, from other uh, revolutionary states. So we say to, to young people, to African people, uh, to working class people, think for yourself. And I know it's difficult because we have this new phenomenon now among even so-called leftists. Uh, what I call left patriotism. What basically they are is patriotic as the, the radical right. And any, any, any state that, uh, that finds itself in the crosshairs of US imperialism becomes the enemy also. Uh, that's backward, but we, but we understand it. I mean, look, you, we, we have uh, an, an educational process in this, in this country that's geared toward uh, turning out good Americans, good, narrow-minded um, Americans. And there's no mistake, I think, that of all the people on this planet, 
the least sophisticated people on the planet are Americans. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. My name is Kampa Davis Mango. I'm an instructor here. Uh, I just wanted to get a feel of uh, what do you think about our electoral process? I think we need to have a more effective electoral process that allows for uh, greater participation. Um, I think that right now, it's very interesting that the most important uh, conversations are now taking place within the Democratic Party process. Um, there's some real issues being debated, uh, and there's a real serious struggle around a vision for this country. Um, but even that debate, that conversation needs to be brought out even more. There are other alternatives or possible alternatives uh, for how we need to, to move uh, this society that's not really getting the light of day. Um, I think that when we look at the electoral process, we have to look beyond just the national level and look at what is happening on the state and local level. And we find that the, um, the same kind of corruption from the two parties uh, will manifest themselves also at every level of government. Uh, uh, and in, in particular, when you look at uh, where most of the uh, spaces where you find a majority or large numbers of black people in these various urban centers, uh, uh, the political leadership is in the hands of, of black folks, black Democrats, uh, who are some of the most backward uh, elements, in my opinion, uh, in this country. Backward politically, that is. Uh, they are carrying out uh, their, their new function as the um, uh, professional administrative managers of, of our people. But they're pushing a neoliberal agenda that has nothing to do with the interests of the vast majority of our people. Um, and the consequence of, of that kind of corruption and backwardness politically on the local and state level is that over the last eight years of the Obama administration, the Democrats lost over 900 seats on the state level. So state houses across the country, they were they, they lost representatives in, in the Senate and the House. Um, so the corruption is pervasive, and therefore the target for the effective political opposition has to also be pervasive in every level of, of government. Uh, then, I mean, that's how you we have an electoral process that becomes more democratic. And so when I talk about democracy, not just going to the uh, polling stations, real democracy extends beyond just voting. It is manifested in every, or should be in every aspect of your life. You know, it, 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 you should have the ability, or we should have the ability to determine uh, whether or not a company relocates into our area or can even leave our area and they're gonna take away jobs, okay? Democracy means rule by the people. But in this place, you know, it's just a, it's just a, a word uh, because we have rule by an oligarchy uh, and we have what I call a capitalist dictatorship. Yeah. No. Uh, Clemmy Solomon, student affairs. Um, based on your experience, insight, and in the current state of political affairs in the U.S., what do you foresee in, in regards to the upcoming 2020 election? Any thoughts about that? I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, it's a very interesting process, Doctor. Um, I, I know people are concerned about, um, about Trump. Um, but I suspect that the machinations within the Democratic Party are, are going to result in uh, a candidate that won't be able to defeat Trump. Uh, therefore, I suspect that uh, uh, unless something drastic or dramatic happens, uh, Donald Trump may be um, going toward a second term. 
And I say that in terms of, it's clear to me that uh, the Democratic Party establishment, they're not that concerned about uh, beating Donald Trump. Now, they pretend to be. You know, of course, they mobilized everybody for the 2018 elections. And, you know, we hear all the talk about the blue wave. They ended up being a blue trickle. Um, but they're more concerned with maintaining the control of the Democratic Party. That's why they are now galvanizing their forces behind um, one candidate, and that's Elizabeth Warren. They were behind uh, Joe Biden. But Joe Biden is, is, and I had predicted, he wasn't going to last past the second uh, debate. Um, they, they had, in, in the background, they had people like uh, um, uh, Cory Booker uh, and Kamala Harris. These are all centrist Democrats. Uh, so they were, you know, and then they encouraged all these people to win, I mean, to, to run, so they could uh, give the impression that there was no front runner besides Joe Biden. So you saw the, you see the news and it says, Joe Biden, 31% support from Democrats. Then all the other ones behind, you know, uh, Sanders, you know, 16, Warren, 14, blah, blah. Well, I looked at that and I'm saying, hmm, I see 70% of Democrats that don't want uh, Joe Biden. But the whole thing was to give the impression that uh, they did not want Sanders picking up the momentum as the inevitable front runner, uh, even though he came in second behind uh, Clinton in 2016. So, you know, their objective basically is they're not going to give up power to the Sanders wing of the Democratic Party, and they would rather lose uh, than do that. They are holding their nose and getting behind Warren. Uh, they're not that crazy about Warren either. Uh, because she still is pretending to be a progressive, a, a progressive liberal. Uh, but they know that she is not going to play with the notion of democratic socialism. And they don't want the model, they don't want the momentum to be created of a real radical uh, winning that nomination with the possibility of winning. Because just like in 2016 when the polls suggested that uh, Sanders could, could, could beat Donald Trump, the same kind of evidence is still there today. Uh, and the powers that be uh, cannot stomach the idea of someone that defines themselves as limited as I might be as a democratic socialist. So long, my long response is um, I'm seeing a second Trump administration. I could be wrong. <clears throat> Any other questions? I'm kind of curious about what you all think about it, though. And if you, I, I pretty much see it the way you did. Pretty much see it the way you did. Well, I was wondering if you could talk more some about um, this, what's happening in this hemisphere with the with the United States, with the troika of tyranny, so called, and all that. And also, maybe if you could talk about its relevance or comparison to uh, Africa, the continent of Africa in particular, Africom, and what that should mean to us in the United States? Very good question, very important question. And I'm glad that we still have some, some, some young folks here. Relative young folks. <laughs> I'm young too. Um, the Africa continent and what's happening here in the region. You know, one thing we're trying to do as, black, as members of the Black Alliance for Peace, and I strongly encourage you all, if you all remember anything today, please remember blackallianceforpeace.com. And go there and just check out the website, okay? You can go to Facebook and check out uh, Black Alliance for Peace. This is a, one of the most interesting and exciting formations to emerge in decades. Young, black, progressive, slash radical uh, activists who are re-embracing our traditions of internationalism. That is that tradition that says, that understands that we are black in the US, but we also are part of 200 million black people throughout the Americas, okay? 
And when you understand that you're part of a larger community, then you don't operate and act like a minority. All right? And you connect the 200 million African people outside of Africa to the billion on the African continent, and now we talk as numbers. So some of us say that's part of the African nation. You know, 1.3 to 1.4 um, billion strong. So in the region, we are concerned not just about the U.S. We're here in the U.S. But we struggle in the U.S. But we're concerned about black people and poor people, white workers also, um, throughout the entire region. So we're concerned about what's happening in Colombia with black people. Most people don't know that in Colombia, that Colombia has the third largest uh, black population outside of Africa. It's Brazil and then. Brazil number one, number two US, number three Colombia, okay? And they are involved in a, a, a horrendous struggle to maintain a possession of their lands. So you got Colombia. Um, you might see some flashes of what's going on in Haiti from time to time, because they're not covering it. They don't cover any of the stuff that's really important to us. There's an uprising in Haiti among black folks, okay? Um, there's, of course, the, you hear this because, you know, the um, corporate media is, is, is pushing this, uh, the, in, the, the intervention into Venezuela. Everybody heard that Venezuela is a dictatorship and, and therefore the U.S has a right and a responsibility to go in and save the people of Venezuela, to bring them democracy. Well, what they don't tell you is that one, that's nonsense. Secondly, that if they go into Venezuela militarily, a lot of people are gonna die. And they don't tell you thirdly that uh, Venezuela is a majority black nation. Did y'all know that? And that the base of the support for the Venezuelan government is in the black community. <laughs> 